So it's a great pleasure for me to uh, welcome Wolfgang Baumeister to our physiology seminar series. Wolfgang is a friend and colleague of many of us at Southwestern, and it's great to have him return to our campus, even though it's only by Zoom this time. Um, Dr. Baumeister is director of the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Martinsreed. Uh, he has wide ranging interests uh, with the general theme of determining the structural basis of biological function. Uh, throughout his career, he has approached this general interest with an eye towards applying new technology to whatever problem is at hand, uh, usually technology that he himself has or has helped uh, to develop. Uh, much of his early work used X-ray crystallography to determine structures of important proteins, including the first crystal structure of the 20S proteasome. Uh, he has subsequently made important technical advances in the development of modern cryo-electron microscopy and has applied this technology to the study of individual proteins and protein complexes. Uh, in many cases, proteins whose complexity made their structures unsolvable by conventional X-ray crystallography. A great example of this, again, is his work uh, on the 26S form of the proteasome. Uh, for this and many other examples, the focus of the work has always been on insights that structures bring to understanding function and regulation. Uh, in parallel with his work on individual proteins, uh, Wolfgang has developed powerful new technologies for cryo-electron tomography, which allows for the study of many of these same proteins in the context of more complex cellular morphology. This work is providing new mechanistic insights into the biology of important cellular processes and some of his current interests include neural synapses and synaptic transmission, uh, protein aggregates and the processes that form them in neurodegenerative diseases and actin networks responsible for force detection and transmission. Uh, Wolfgang has received pages and pages of honors and awards and in the interest of time, I'll not recite all of them here so that we can get on with the science. So Wolfgang, thanks again very much for joining us and we're looking forward to your seminar entitled uh, Structural Biology in Situ or The Power of Seeing the Whole Picture. I'll remind the, the attendees to please um, mute your mics. Uh, we'll ask, you can ask questions via the chat room or I'll unmute you. Um, at the appropriate time. So again, Wolfgang, take it away. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you, George, for the generous introduction. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation, even though I would very much have preferred to be <coughs> there in, in person. So I think you can see the screen, right? So yes. The, the, okay, good. So. I mean, why do we want to do structural biology in C2 at all? I think traditionally structural biologists approach cellular complexity in a reductionist manner. That means cells are taken apart, the molecular components are fractionated, they are purified, and then they are studied one by one with the established methods of structural biology. Now, <clears throat> I think this divide and conquer approach has been very successful. But it's also clear that only rarely biological functions can be attributed to individual molecules. Biological functions or cellular functions arise from the interaction between the many molecular species inhabiting cells by acting in concert. So structural biology in situ aims at studying macromolecular, supramolecular structures in their functional context. That means inside unperturbed cellular environments. Now, the method that enables us doing that is cryo-electron tomography, and most of my talk will deal with cryo-ET studies. Basically, it is the application of the principles of tomographic data acquisition, tilting a specimen in the beam, collecting projection images, and then merging them to form a three-dimensional image that is more informative than the projection images, as you see on the right-hand side, a mitochondrion in the vicinity of <clears throat> a lipid droplet. 
I mean, I don't want to go into the details here of cryo-electron tomography, but may, made suffice to say that it combines the best possible structural preservation of cellular structures. So the only preparation step is rapid freezing, vitrifying the sample. It combines that with the power of three-dimensional imaging. Now, <clears throat> let me inject a little quotation here. Uh, that is from Freeman Dyson, an eminent mathematician, physicist. He said in his book, Imagined Worlds, new directions in science are launched by new tools, much more often than by new concepts. The effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in new ways. The effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that have to be explained. And I think the discovery potential of <clears throat> cryo-electron tomography is huge. I should say that the idea of doing something like electron tomography of unstained material was not new. There was a remarkable paper published by Roger Hart. He was at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory more than 50 years ago. If you read the abstract, it's clear that the polytropic montage, he called the method, is <clears throat> synonymous to electron tomography. And he came to the conclusion that preliminary results indicate that one may thus study unstained, unshadowed biological material at high resolution. <clears throat> this paper has been largely ignored, I would say. The reason is that the only example he could show at the time of was, I mean, a tomogram, if you like, of uh, freeze-dried material, and there were no recognizable sort of features at the time. The problem is that, I mean, biological material, unstained biological material in ice is extremely radiation sensitive. So it has taken a long time to, <clears throat> so the vision was there, but the technology was not there. We began to work on electron tomography, cryo-electron tomography, about uh, 35 years ago, and it was only about 30 years ago that we could show that the cumulative electron dose in collecting tomographic 3D data sets uh, can be kept small enough for the investigation of ice embedded specimens because of automating the data acquisition. So historically, this was the very first electron, cryo electron tomogram ever taken. It was something as trivial as lipid vesicles embedded in ice. Now, <clears throat> I think then there was a phase when we could do some more interesting tomography, but it was limited to only small objects, such as viruses or small prokaryotic cells. Thickness was a big problem. I mean, beyond, let's say, half a micrometer, one micrometer, samples become, um, are no longer transparent to the electron beam. So <clears throat> this is an example of a collaboration at the time with Elisa Stevens' lab at the NIH. So we looked into herpes simplex virus. So that, that was possible. But I, I should make the point that, I mean, we had to recognize at the time, when you look at the top left panel, that the tomograms are, because of the dose limitation, pretty noisy. And this was one of the first examples of what we call subtomogram averaging. If, I mean, a structure, contains something repetitive features, let's put it that way, <clears throat> like, I mean, the icosahedral nucleocapsid here, then we can do, extract them computationally, and then we can do averaging, subtomogram averaging, and we can put them back precisely into the context <clears throat> of, of the entire tomogram, but with an improved uh, signal to noise ratio and improved resolution. Now, <clears throat> to illustrate the problem of specimen thickness, we have an ongoing project which is by no means finished. And that is we are interested in the molecular architecture of the, um, <clears throat> of the mouse retina rod outer segments. So that is, is this part here of the photoreceptor cell. We are interested in the molecular architecture of the disc membranes here. So we made a first attempt a bit more than 10 years ago at the time, and you see the problem that was an image of, of this rod outer segment here, and you see it's pretty dark and not very informative. Now, I think what was a game changer here was the development of 
uh, focused iron beam milling. So what you see here is cells, I think in this case, adictyostelium cells sitting directly on a, grown on an EM grid. And we have <clears throat> what we call a dual beam instrument. So we have an SEM to monitor what we are doing. And we have a, a, a focused iron beam, gallium ions, which ablate material and we can cut into the cell. I mean, kind of very thin windows. So the main geometry we are using to, <clears throat> to generate what we call lamella is basically, as you see in the, in the top panel here, to ablate material from the top and the bottom, leaving behind a thin lamella that is supported only by the surrounding ice. And <clears throat> so we can generate, I mean, slices, which are typically, let's say, between 100, 200 nanometers in thickness. And so uh, ideal for, for tomography. Now, I should say that I think everything benefits from a couple of developments in the EM technology that have taken place in the past, uh, well, seven, seven, eight years, I would say, well, maybe 10 years. First of all, I think the latest generation of electron microscopes is largely automated. So I think throughput is massively increased and we have more consistent quality of, of the images. Then I think there is, um, <clears throat> I think, a game changer where the direct detectors, which have replaced, I mean, CCD cameras, much better <clears throat> quantum um, efficiency, I mean, and then there's a little device I want to mention that is the faceplate for enhancement of contrast to illustrate that. Basically, if you take an image of <clears throat> the biological material embedded in ice and take the image in focus, there's hardly any contrast as you see on the left hand side. So what has been done for a long time is basically to go to some sort of defocus, which results in a weird contrast transfer function and this kind of ghostly image. What we would like to have is something like the equivalent of the Cernica faceplate in light microscopy, enabling a face contrast in focus. And the Volta faceplate is a little device in the back focal plane of, of, <clears throat> of the microscope that, I mean, causes a phase shift and allows to generate face contrast in, um, <clears throat> in focus. So you see the difference now, I mean, combining focused ion beam milling new detectors, um, faceplate here for the, the, um, the disc membranes here of the photoreceptor cell. This is the difference between, I mean, no faceplate at a defocus of three micrometers here. And this is, I mean, with a faceplate. Now, I think it's not for the, if you want to push resolution to the utmost limit, but the improvement in contrast can be extremely valuable as you see here, for instance. We wanted to know, I mean, what, I mean, uh, maintains the long range order of these membranes in the um, <clears throat> broad outer segments here. And there's one type of spacer here and there's another type of spacer here. And we are identifying them now using knockouts of, of candidate proteins here. But what we really want to do in this project, which as I said, is still <clears throat> incomplete, is basically to look for the supramicroorganization of rhodopsin and the rhodopsin interactors. That is still a challenge in terms of the image processing of the image analysis to detect rhodopsin densities in the bilayer membrane. I mean, there's almost density matching there and combine a cluster analysis with subtomogram averaging. I think we, we can detect the, the main densities. We have made progress recently because we were able to determine <clears throat> Um, atomic resolution structure of rhodopsin dimers, which are um, the supposed, I mean, um, um, elements um, of rhodopsin or, or rhodopsin forms in, in these membranes. Now, I think that is um, more to show some of the challenges. I think now I will go to a couple of projects that have been brought to conclusion. So the first one is from work of Julia Mahamid, now at EMBL. Julia had grown um, HeLa cells directly on EM grids. And that is, I mean, outlines here, their, <clears throat> their nucleus. Here we look at that in the focused ion beam. Then we cut a thin lamella at the periphery of <clears throat> the um, nuclear envelope here. And on the, on the bottom left, 
we have now the lamella that we examine in the microscope. As we take a tomogram now, we can walk basically from the inside of the nucleus, that is the region here of the heterochromatin. If you look at that, I mean, you see, I mean, relatively faintly, but at least you can see individual nucleosomes. They're forming change. Still, again, it is a huge challenge to establish the connectivity between nucleosomes here. As you approach the, uh, the nuclear envelope, the inside of the nuclear envelope, you reach the region where the nuclear envelope is covered with the nuclear lamina, filaments, intermediate filaments that form this meshwork here. Then we have here, I mean, an individual nuclear pore complex on the inside. Here is the same nuclear pore complex further outside, I mean, on the cytoplasmic side. And here we are now on um, the um, outer membrane or the outer surface of the nuclear envelope, which is studied with ribosomes, which you form, which form polysomes and so forth. Now we can do some image processing. I think they are powerful, fully automated um, um, methods for segmentation of filaments, be it microtubules, that are, is easy actin filaments and the nuclear lamina. As I said before, whenever we have uh, repetitive structures like nuclear pore complexes, we can do subtomogram averaging. Now, the structure which you see here of a nuclear pore complex is not the highest resolution. I mean, we have done higher resolution averages, but I mean, it's remarkable. And it was an average created with only, I mean, a handful of individual nuclear pore complexes. And that was because of the improved contrast, I mean, here with the faceplate. Now, why is that important? It's important because, I mean, the nuclear pore complex is a variable structure. It can vary in diameter quite a bit by something like 13% or so. So I think ideally one would like to push um, resolution to, to uh, I mean, to, to obtain structures of that kind here um, with single nuclear pore complexes. Ribosomes are relatively easy and one can, I mean, easily create subtomogram averages to a higher resolution. That is now a synopsis of this work here. So again, I mean, on the inside, we are in the region of the heterochromatin. Then in this pink color here, we have, I mean, the meshwork of the nuclear lamina nuclear pore complexes, polysomes on the surface here, actin filaments in red and microtubules in green. Um, so um, that is this, this project here. Now, I think now I will talk about some work we have done recently with an algae that was introduced to the lab by, by a postdoc, Ben Engel. Um, that is, we used Chlamydomonas. Chlamydomonas has a couple of advantages over other cell types. The cytoplasm, but also the nucleoplasm is a little bit less crowded than, let's say, a yeast cell. And the other advantage is that Chlamydomonas has an almost deterministic topology of organelles. So what you see here is a lamella supported by the surrounding eyes. And so we, we look here, there's the region of of the chloroplast and so on and so forth. So it's, it's basically a slice to an entire chlamydomonas cell. So because, I mean, we have this deterministic topology of organelles, it's fairly easy in this case to have orientation, to zoom in on any part here of the cell. For instance, this is here the region surrounding the Golgi apparatus, that is the nucleus here. Mitochondria, I mean, well, can be at various places, but they're easy to find. This is the region here, the chloroplast, and so on and so forth. So on the left-hand side, you see a tomogram of this region surrounding the, the Golgi apparatus. You see, I mean, on the right-hand side, you see the nuclear envelope here. Here is a gap. That is the region of a nuclear pore complex. Um, top left, I mean, we have a piece of endoplasmic reticulum studied with ribosomes. We have COP1 vesicles here and, and so on and so forth. So what we can do is we can zoom in on any of these features and <clears throat> create subtomogram averages. Here we have used a larger number to determine the structure of the nuclear pore complex, which I mean is in Chlamydomonas a bit different from let's say yeast or, or other systems. I mean, the key elements like the Y complex here are the same, but I mean, um, uh, they are, um, uh, the, the, um, 
the organization of, of the Y complex in the nuclear pore complex is somewhat different and as a consequence, the pore is quite, is wide open here. So ribosomes are of course abundant. They're always the easiest to deal with, also have higher contrast than protein because of the high RNA content. So we can easily extract ribosomes here from, <clears throat> from this tomogram and create an average without pushing the envelope in this case, but to a resolution of something like 8.5 angstrom. Um, these are ribosomes sitting on the endoplasmic reticulum, so on the protein conducting SEC61 channel here. You see here resolution is again something in the seven angstrom range here. So we can zoom in, for instance, here on the region of the protein conducting channel and you see very clearly resolved helices. So um, as you would expect at a resolution of something like seven angstrom. Now, I should say that there was still a limitation with focused ion beam milling and the limitation was that it could easily be applied to individual cells grown directly on an EM grid, but it cannot be applied to, let's say, a multicellular organism such as Chlamydomonas, uh, so, such as uh, C. elegans, sorry, or it cannot be applied to tissue. Now, so we have developed a different approach um, that is focused ion beam milling using a lift out uh, preparation technique. I think I run the movie again. So basically we cut vertically into, into the material targeting in this case, guided by fluorescence microscopy, uh, targeting cell in, in the gut of C. elegans here. So we cut essentially two trenches here and then I think we use, I mean, a mechanical gripper to lift out the material, which is still too thick, two micrometers or something like that. You have to bring it again um, in, into position it in, in, a, in a specialized holder for further thinning. And then we can take a tomogram here and what you see on the right hand side is a slice through a tomogram of a part of a cell in the gut. So we see co coated vesicles here. We have here the, the endoplasmic reticulum started with the ribosome, cross sections of microtubules, et cetera, et cetera. Again, we can do subtomogram averaging applied here to the, to the ribosomes. We can do classification. We see that we have ribosomes in two different states. Resolution is something like 11, 12 angstroms in this case here. Um, we can distinguish the two states by the occupancy with tRNA. And so we can map back, let's say, the two classes which have different occupancy, different states of the elongation cycle. Um, we can map them back to, to the tomogram. You will see that more often with other examples. Now, I think George mentioned in his introduction that we have a long-standing interest, not in ribosomes, but in the opponent of the ribosome, if you like. That is the proteasome, which I think, as most of you will know, I mean, operate ex to executive end of the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. So targeting um, proteins marked for destruction by ubiquitilation. So the 26S proteasome is I mean, a 2.5 megadalton complex, 35 different subunits here. And we began to, uh, to, to work on the structure of the hollow complex, again, something like, like 10 years ago. At that time, resolution was typically not near atomic resolution. It was usually we got stuck at, at a resolution of seven, eight angstroms. And this is a seven, eight angstrom map of the entire complex. What is meant to illustrate here is that this map as such could not be interpreted in terms of the molecular architecture, the subunit architecture of the complex here. So we had to use an integrative approach in which we combined cross-linking of the complex with mass spec and that provided, I mean, distance restraints, which I mean, in an integrative modeling approach, which we did with Andre Charlie of, um, um, of uh, the University of um, of California at San Francisco to derive from that, I mean, um, an, a near atomic model at the time. Now, I should say, I think, and all that is of course not in situ now. I think as George mentioned, I think the structure of the core complex, the 20 s proteasome could be determined by X-ray crystallography long, long time ago, 25 years or so now. 
But I mean, because of the instability, the dynamics of the whole complex, I think the 26 has remained elusive. Now, in the meantime, there are numerous structures of the 26 S complex. We have done the human one, for instance, at a resolution in the range of 3.7, 3.8 angstrom. So we have now, I mean, high enough resolution to, to produce, I mean, an atomic model of the, the hollow complex here. So I think, yeah, but in, in blue, you see, I mean, the, the regulatory particle, I should say, is prepare substrates for degradation in the core complex. It recognizes ubiquitilated proteins, it deubiquitilates them, it unfolds them and it assists in the translocation into the core complex where degradation takes place in the cavity, which is here at the center of the core complex between the beta subunit rings. So it undergoes very large conformational changes during its functional cycle. They are driven by a triple A ATPS module shown in blue here. And I mean, that basically serves to bring down the substrate from the uh, receptors RPN10, RPN13, which are here at the distal end, down to the mouth of the triple A ATPS for unfolding and, um, and kind of pushing, pulling them into the core complex. There are large conformational changes, I mean, rotations of whole modules of subunits of something like 25 degrees. That serves, for instance, to bring the deubiquitylase into a position to remove the ubiquitin. It also serves to align the unfolding channel in the ATPase with the gate that controls access to the core particle. So there's now a pretty detailed mechanistic understanding of the functional cycle of, of the 26 as proteasome. And because the conformational changes are so large, and we can even at lower resolution, let's say in the 10, 12 angstrom range, which we can attain fairly easily now in situ, we can by correlation decide or infer from, I mean, <clears throat> the conformation what the activity status of a given proteasome is. So I will illustrate that with returning now to chlamydomonas. The first question is where are the proteasomes located in chlamydomonas? I think you see that relatively clearly here in this panel. You see, basically, I think they are in the vicinity of um, uh, the inner membrane of the nuclear envelope here. And then we have typically two or three punctae in this region here where the endoplasmic reticulum is located. So <clears throat> we can zoom in now into these regions and look for the proteasomes. You see here, for instance, this is again the nuclear envelope here. And even in the raw images without any post-processing, you can recognize, let's say, the characteristic features of the 20S com 26S complex, the core complex, and two regulatory particles, and so on. So we can do, of course, subtomogram averaging, and this is the first subtomogram average without serious classification here. So I mean, it's a kind of a global average of all 26S particles here. Now, but we can do go into a deeper classification. We can fairly easily distinguish between single capped and double capped 26S complexes. They coexist with very similar abundance. We can, as I said, I mean, infer from the conformational state which one is in the ground state, not dealing with substrate, but sitting there and waiting for substrate, and which one, I mean, is actively degrading substrate. Furthermore, we can look what are the interactions in the immediate context here, whether something is membrane tethered or tethered to, to distinct parts of the nuclear pore complex. And we can do a fairly quantitative analysis. I don't want to go here into, into much detail. Now, we can, as I said, map back the proteasomes now to the tomogram. So that is the tomogram on the right-hand side. We have the cytosol, there's a mitochondrion. This is the nuclear envelope. These are nuclear pore complexes. So we see in light blue, all the 26 S proteasomes, many of them in close vicinity to nuclear pore complexes. We can distinguish between single cap, double cap. The green ones are in the ground state. The pink ones are in the membrane processing state. And then we have what we call membrane tethered and, um, and basket tethered. So we can 
go a bit deeper into that and zoom in on all the proteasomes in the vicinity of the nuclear pore complex. There we have two distinct populations. We have one in shown in red here. These are those which are very close to the level of the membrane of, <clears throat> of, the, of the membrane at the periphery of nuclear pore complexes. Then we have the yellow population. That is a population that is further away from the level of the membrane, but closer to the center or to the eightfold axis of the nuclear pore complex. Now we can show also directly that those guys here kind of interact directly with the nuclear basket. So you see here individual nuclear pore complexes. You see in, in yellow, the ones that are, I mean, further away from, from the nuclear pore complex, they are directly tethered to the, to the basket. And then the other guys here sitting, I mean, at the periphery, but it attached to the nuclear envelope. So basically this is the summary of, of this um, a study here. So we, we, I think we, they have distinct functions. We assume, but I mean, we are still in the process of identifying the tether that those here are involved in import export surveillance. Then we have those here where we think they have a role in maintaining the two, the distinct protein compositions of the outer and inner membrane of the nuclear envelope, which is continuous here at this site. Now, as I told you before, I mean, the second um, cluster of, of proteasomes is in, in the region where the endoplasmic reticulum is located. Now, this is, I mean, a kind of um, um, a standard picture of, of ER-associated degradation of the ERAT pathway. Well, as, as most of you know, I mean, Proteins are synthesized on the endoplasmic reticulum. They are translocated into the R where they are supposed to fold properly with the assistance of chaperones. But that can go wrong, especially under stress conditions. But there's no powerful degradation machinery here inside the ER. So to remove these aggregates here in the so-called unfolded protein response, I mean, they have to be retro-translocated here to the cytoplasm where they are then degraded by, by the proteasome. So I think that is a very well studied pathway here. Um, <clears throat> hundreds of, of publications. However, I mean, let's say the supramolecular organization of, of this pathway, I mean, um, was, was kind of unknown. So as we zoom in now on sites of the endoplasmic reticulum, where I mean proteasomes cluster. The proteasomes, shown he, proteasomes are shown here in red, in blue are ribosomes, which are much more abundant. The dark blue ones are those, I mean, um, sitting directly on the ER. The light blue ones are free ribosomes here. And we see all this, we have clusters here on the endoplasmic reticulum, typically on the side opposite to the side where I mean vesicles, um, um, coated vesicles leave the, the ER, <clears throat> um, so I mean, secretion of vesicles and the degradation sites are spatially always separated. Now, we try to zoom in here on these clusters here, which are typically, I mean, 30 or so individual proteasomes. And we do a molecule by molecule analysis of these tomograms here. Now, <clears throat> I think we have not done, I mean, one way is if we have a good structure, we can use that as a template and search for, <clears throat> for matching structures. But that is not what we have done here. What we have done is basically we, ticked, we, we picked all the densities in these clusters and did a classification according to similarity and generated, I mean, sub-tomogram or sub classes here from which we generated subtomograms. And <clears throat> so, so all the molecules were um, put into this analysis and that is the outcome. So, I mean, one class is of course the proteasomes, the ribosomes, <clears throat> but then also we found, I mean, we obtained a decent average, even though it's not very abundant, of CDC48, which has always been implicated in the ERAT pathway. <clears throat> and the, <clears throat> the, the dominant thinking is basically that CDC48 acts as a segregase and, I mean, does the first action on the retrotranslocated 
<clears throat> substrate and ha then hands over to the proteasome. Now, let's zoom into such an ERAT cluster here sitting on, sitting on the ER. You see the region where the proteasomes are is completely devoid of ribosomes. <clears throat> you see, again, proteasomes in red. You see CDC48, which is not a very abundant molecule here, sitting mostly at the periphery of these clusters here. So, again, ribosomes forming polysomes. There's the position more clearly of CDC48 in one typical um, ERAT micro compartment here. So, and we can again do a deeper analysis. We can distinguish between, between assembly states, single cap, double cap. I don't want to talk much about that. <clears throat> we can distinguish between ground state and substrate processing proteasomes here. The interesting thing is um, those that are further away, that is the distance to the ER membrane, those that are further away are typically, we see very little activity there those that are closest to the endoplasmic reticulum. As a matter of fact, if you average those here, they are directly tethered to the ER, whatever the density here may be. But I think they're the, I mean, at least 50% of all particles are in the process of uh, working on substrate. I should finally say here that these micro compartments are very dynamic structures. So you see basically they can assemble de novo and they, we have liquid-like fusion processes in these, in these puncti. That is our schematic summary of, of this story here. I mean, so we have the proteasome cluster. We have, I mean, most of the uh, CDC48 in this region here but we have many proteasomes that making direct contact to the, to the membrane here, direct tethered. And so I think, I, I think there's also quite some literature saying that also 26S can be involved itself in pulling out substrate from the ER. So we, just, we suggest to, that there might be a direct and indirect ERAT pathway. I think in the next couple of minutes, I will talk about um, another major project in the lab in the past couple of years that is <clears throat> in a consortium that is funded by uh, the European Research Council called Toxic Protein Aggregation in Neurodegeneration or TOPAC. It's a collaboration between my colleague Ulrich Hartl, who is interested in how do the toxic aggregates affect proteostasis in, in cells and can we boost the cellular defenses against aggregation, for instance, um, by chaperones. My colleague, Matthias Mann, who is a mass spec proteomics expert, what is the composition of the aggregates? How does the cellular proteome change in response to toxic aggregation? And we are interested, what is the in situ structure of the aggregates? <clears throat> How do they interact with the cellular environment? Let me begin with the first case we studied. This was, I mean, Huntington's disease. I mean, I think you all know that, I mean, if you have a polycue repeat um, here, I mean, near the end terminus of Huntington, it's the only part that is, I mean, we determined the atomic resolution structure of Huntington recently, which was quite an effort. But I mean, the polycue repeat is flexible and remained invisible in this structure here. Um, so if that repeat is longer than, let's say, 35, 36 residues or so, then it forms an unstable protein forming aggregates. Now, this study required a relatively complex workflow. The first step is always, I mean, of course, vitrification, which in this case with neurons is uh, not very difficult. Then the next step is, I mean, a neuron is a huge landscape compared with the field of view of a tomogram, which is maybe one micrometer by one micrometer or so. So we have to identify and to locate where the aggregate material is, which is done by correlative fluorescence microscopy. Then we can zoom in on this, reach, oops, on this region here um, by focused ion beam milling, cutting a lamella that accommodates the, the aggregate material, and then we take um, the tomogram. So that is now a tomogram zooming in on a Huntington aggregate in a primary neuron. 
the Huntington fibrils are shown in blue. We can measure, I mean, the curvature, the persistence length as a measure of their stiffness. Now, what is interesting at the periphery, I mean, I should first say that essentially within the aggregate, we don't find um, any larger macromolecular species. It's largely empty fibril, fibril material. At the periphery, I mean, we have in red uh, endoplasmic reticulum, but we see it's heavily fragmented here. And as a consequence of the destruction of the endoplasmic reticulum, the ribosomes shown here in, in green become liberated, but they remain at the periphery of this aggregate material. Um, so I think the mechanism is still not really understood, but what we see, and we can recapitulate also, I mean, in in vitro experiments, if the fibrils, I mean, touch a membrane or a vesicle of some kind, locally, the curvature of the membrane changes drastically and that destabilizes the membrane here. So uh, that seems to be the, the destructive mechanism of interaction of Huntington fibrils in the cellular environment. The second example is, I think from our perspective, even more interesting. That is, I mean, basically um, a disease model of ALS. So I think the hallmark of this disease is basic, basically a hexanucleotide expansion in this gene here. This may lead to a loss of native function of the gene product here, but it certainly results in the production of toxic D-peptide repeats. And what is found, found in patients' brains is um, usually that they contain polyglycine alanine repeats here, as shown here. They also, I mean, can also be glycine pro proline, but I mean, it's mostly glycine alanine repeat. So <clears throat> we had a construct <clears throat> that can recapitulate basically some of the phenotype and it generates aggregates. Again, we have to do the, 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 um, the, the correlative workflow. So again, we grow the cells on the grid. We identify cells carrying an inclusion here by fluorescence microscopy. We target the inclusion here. We can confirm in the lamella that it contains the aggregate material, and then we can take the tomogram. In the fibrils we can, if we want, and we have done that, I mean, identify by, by decorating them with GFP. But so this is a tomogram of a polyglycine alanine <clears throat> repeat in a primary neuron. At a glance, you might, it might look like we have again fibrils of some kind, but as a matter of fact, what the, the filaments you see are not really fibrils, they are um, polymorphic ribbons. But, and what you also see that, I mean, unlike in the Huntington case, we have many, I mean, particles inside the aggregate material. Um, <clears throat> which, I mean, we, we can pick and then analyze. So that is, again, the molecule by molecule analysis here of um, glycine alanine um, aggregate material. In red, you see the polymorphic ribbons often bifurcated. You see at the outside, again, and that is similar to Huntington ribosomes, they cannot penetrate the aggregate material. In, in, this, in this pink color here, I mean, you see, I mean, the main chaperonin acting downstream of, of, um, of <clears throat> the ribosome here. And with, within the aggregate material, we have only essentially one molecular species. We have a 40-fold increase in the local concentration of proteasomes inside the aggregate material. Now that we have so many 26 cell proteasomes, we can push resolution relatively far in subtomogram averaging and classification. So in green, you see proteasomes in the aggregate material, which are in the ground state. You can distinguish two slightly different ground states. And you see now resolution is in the 10 angstrom range here. And in blue, we have we have 26 proteasomes which are in the substrate processing state. Resolution is a little bit lower, 12 or so angstrom, because, I mean, we have fewer particles. But invariably, those, I mean, in the substrate processing state have some additional mass, which is not accounted for by the, the density of the proteasome itself. And again, we can map back that population, the substrate processing one, 
to the tomogram and invariably these proteasomes are in direct physical contact with the aggregate material. It is our interpretation and there's some evidence for it. I mean, they try to degrade the aggregate material, but probably the alanine glycine repeat, um, I think it's, it's known that it has a silk-like structure. It's very hard to unfold. And as a consequence, the proteasomes become stalled by being unable to, to unfold and degrade. Now, <clears throat> I think we can show that, I mean, the additional density in this case interacts with RPN1, which is the, the largest subunit of the regulatory particle. We are currently trying to refine, I mean, the interaction a little bit further. More recently, I mean, we have also been extended that work to um, alpha synuclein. I mean, to, to in, a, in a model of Parkinson's disease. Again, we see here fibrils here in, in the aggregate material interspersed with, um, um, yeah, uh, um, highly disordered and seriously damaged organelles. So <clears throat> I think that is a comparison from a, um, from a paper, uh, a news and views written by Wade Harper. It's different aggregates, different mechanisms. So poly, <clears throat> um, the poly-Q, I mean, in the case of Huntington, seems to interact destructively with membranes, especially of the ER. In the case of polyglycine alanine, I think it seems to be that while the proteasomes try to degrade, they become, as the, the aggregates grow, all trapped basically inside the aggregate material. And that certainly compromises, I mean, protein quality control in this um, setting. Now, finally, I think uh, I just want to mention, we started a new project in the lab uh, in collaboration with my colleague Brenda Schulman, and that is uh, we look into another pathway of protein degradation, protein quality control, that is um, autophagy. So, I mean, in the first step, we wanted to follow basically from the initial formation of, let's say, a phagophore, and then, then the growth of a phagophore that closes into the autophagosome to the process of fusion in, in yeast here, into with the vacuole. And so I think I won't just, I mean, this is at very early days in this project, but I mean, it sees we can study that also quite nicely. This is, let's say, a later phagophore here. We can study here. I mean, this is only a slice to the tomogram. We can study with the interaction with the ER, which it needs to let the membrane grow. This is now the closed autophagosome, and that is now <clears throat> the autophagosome fused to the vacuole where, I mean, it has to be, um, where the membrane is then degraded further by lipases and then the content is, is in the vacuole. So <clears throat> that is early days. So we are still not really on the molecular level there, but that will come. Now, I think finally, let me ask the question, I mean, can we, in the end, I mean, reveal the molecular sociology of cells in atomic detail? That is from a little review we wrote um, two years ago. So we have to realize the full potential of cryo-OT and there's a lot of room for improvement. I think the FIP is still relatively slow and a bottleneck. So fibbing a lamella is something like one and a half, two hours. And um, <clears throat> I think that can be improved probably by a factor of 10. The lift out technology, I mean, is more than a proof of concept, but I mean, it's not yet a totally reliable and uh, commercially available technology. I think, um, I think it's very obvious that we would like to have an, <clears throat> in order to simplify the workflow that we integrate, let's say, cryofluorescence microscopy with the ion beam instrument, and we are making efforts in, in this direction. I think it's important to narrow down the resolution gap between cryo EM and cryo light microscopy or fluorescence microscopy. I think ideally we would like to be able, I mean, we want like to combine the power of uh, fluorescence microscopy in identifying a molecular species with a higher resolution of cryo EM. And so ideally we would like to be able to map, let's say a fluorescent signal on the tomogram. Um, 
a resolution limiting factor is still specimen motion. I think one can combat that to some extent computationally, but I think um, we might, must find better ways also experimentally to eliminate the effect. So I think cameras have been improved massively, but they are still not at their limits and faceplates. I mean, the current solution is only a preliminary solution. I think we need to develop more powerful methods. I, illustrated that at the beginning with the rod outer segments for mining the rich information of tomograms using deep learning for segmentation template free methods for particle detection and sorting uh, i think very similar to how we did let's say um, single particle analysis at the time when we couldn't go to atomic resolution we would like to be able to integrate complementary information let's say about protein stoichiometry, abundance, proximity, to have distance restraints, to, to map basically, um, to use, let's say, the, the larger particles as anchor points, but map then um, th the smaller molecules, which we cannot easily um, detect and average, I mean, into an integrative model of, um, of a given system. So let me conclude with the Acknowledgements, I think Sarada was a, was a graduate student together with Ben Engel. She did all the work on proteasomes in Chlamydomonas. I did not talk about Shaw's work. Felix Boyerlein did the work on Huntington. Florian Beck was involved in helped many people with image processing. Anna Bieber, Christina Capitano uh, working together with um, Florian Wilfling on <clears throat> On um, autophagy, Rado developed the faceplate. Rubén um, was involved in all um, the um, toxic protein aggregates projects. Friedrich Förster contributed quite a bit to the 26 cell proteasome structure. Shanguo did the work on the glycine alanine repeats. Julia was involved in several projects, including Lift Out together with Miroslava Schaffer. Antonio <clears throat> was the expert in segmentation. Jürgen Plitzko was in charge of many of the uh, technology developments. Matthias Pöge worked on, um, <clears throat> on the rod outer segment and Eri Sakata also worked on uh, the proteasome. And I thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. Terrific, absolutely terrific. Great. Um, there are a couple of questions already here. I'm going to ask the first one, which relates yep. to one of those, and and, and that is, um, does your methodology allow you to identify and maybe even quantitate uh, proteasome forms other than 26s, so ones that are cap have these alternate caps or even free? 20S proteasomes and cells? 20S free is, uh, that is quite possible. I think we have shown that in a, <clears throat> in, well, in Sho Azano's paper on, on neurons. So 20S <clears throat> is relatively easy. <clears throat> Other forms, I mean, um, I know what you are referring to, but, um, well, usually they don't, the systems we have looked at do not contain these other forms, okay? So, I mean, what we see in many cases are, um, but that is typically also a small subpopulation of something like 10% or so, are of course incompletely assembled regulatory particles. And some of them would be not easy to distinguish from, um, from, from other forms. I mean, I, I think, um, I think we would see them, we would be able to classify them without any doubt, but I mean, um, we haven't found them in, in, in the neurons we studied extensively. Okay, well, so Ilya Bezpervani uh, asks a related question, functional question then, um, yeah. is 20S proteasome able to degrade protein <laughs> in cells on its own or only as part of the 26S complex? I think, the 20s, I mean, I, I think we have no in situ evidence for, for that. I mean, and as a matter of fact, let's say in, in neurons where we have done fairly comprehensive studies, 20s alone is a relatively rare species. 
something five to to ten percent of the total population. I'm. Uh, there was supposed to be a meeting at the Weizmann Institute in, in January, which had to be cancelled because of the pandemic, about the, the role of 20S alone. I think 20S alone, I can only imagine that it degrades um, unfolded proteins, which in many cases will exist and will be around. But I don't think there's any evidence, at least I'm not aware of, that 20S alone can degrade properly folded proteins. So a, a question from Warren. You, you, you agree or disagree? I, I, I agree. Although I, I'm still not totally yeah. convinced that uh, we, we have good physiologic evidence for that. Mm -hmm. Even for yeah. It's a very, very easy to get in vitro. So it's a, in, in vitro, I think, um, I, no I think there's no question. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. OK. So uh, another question is it's very impressive presentation and work. Would you say that an alpha sinu that alpha synuclein behaves more like poly Q or poly GA? Did you see any membrane damage with alpha synuclein? No, we did not see any membrane damage. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, uh, we let's put it that way. We don't see any direct interaction with membranes, unlike, I mean, um, in the case of Huntington. On the other hand, I mean, embedded in the aggregates of alpha synuclein um, are all sorts of damaged organelles, okay? But we don't see, and I think the paper will come out, I think in a week or so in, um, <clears throat> in, um, in, in nature communications, we don't see any direct interaction of the kind, let's say, similar to Huntington, where we always see them touching the membrane. We see the changes, the dramatic changes in, in curvature, um, but that is, we don't see any, we have analyzed a very large data set. We don't see any direct interaction, but the question is, of course, what generates, or well, what is the destructive element for <clears throat> um, the organelles, the membranes embedded in the aggregates. We don't have an answer to that so far. Okay, let's see. I think I'm going to switch. Mark, would you like to try to, I'm glad to read this, but if you'd like to ask it directly, that's fine. Yeah, hi, thank you so much. This was amazing. Um, I'm, this is Mark Diamond. I was just curious, um, it seems like right now we can only uh, kind of call out the structures of proteins for which we, we sort of have an idea of what we're looking for. Um, and I was wondering if you could envision ways to kind of increase the scope of identity of proteins through some sort of genetic tags or other ways that would mark the, mm -hmm. prote the proteins expressed in the cell in such a way that you would be able to, um, you know, identify proteins within structures you know, identify yeah. have a clue. Well, I think once I mean, let's, uh, I mean, uh, there's still scope in improving resolution. And once I mean, we get, let's say, routinely to a level <clears throat> where we see alpha helices, then of course we can um, check that against the, the protein data bank and we should be able to identify. On the other hand, one has to say that roughly, let's say, of the entire cellular proteome. Still today, we have typically only 30% or so of the, proteins, of, of the proteome where we have high resolution structures. So there is still um, um, a, a lot missing out there. Moreover, I mean, we might have a reference structure, but I think it might be in a different conformation. So the question about tax, I mean, yes, we have been playing with that a little bit, but I'm not convinced that this is a solution. I mean, we have kind of uh, generated uh, protein origami, which we can attach and they have a distinct shape, but I mean, that is, they are still extremely difficult to detect in crowded tomograms. I think the, <clears throat> the most promising approach is really to bring, uh, or to narrow the resolution gap between fluorescence microscopy and, and cryo-EM. 
So once we can really go to something like, let's say, 20 nanometers in fluorescent microscopy, and then we, we have, I mean, <clears throat> that we can use to identify and if we can map that on the tomogram, I think this um, um, brings us closer to identification. I think uh, the correlative approach will be the more powerful, more powerful than, than um, um, genetic, um, genetically encoded labels. I think I think I strongly believe that I think we we still have to improve on on resolution. I think as soon as we get really, as I said before, to clearly sub nanometer resolution, I think uh, then I think all proteins take shape, and of course, uh, the protein data bank will eventually be filled. Got it. Thank you. Uh uh, another question. Long, I'm glad to read this. If you want to ask it directly, you're, you can do it. Okay, yeah. So, thank you, Professor, for a nice talk. So, I just want to worry is, uh, fit million, uh, how could we determine the correct Z position of your target? So, no, I mean, uh, that is, is, again, I mean, a little bit trial and error. I think it should be guided by, by <clears throat> that is why I said we want to integrate and I think there are developments un underway. It, uh, <clears throat> we, we need basically uh, the FIP milling to be guided by confocal microscopy in the end in order to, so currently, I mean, <clears throat> um, we, we are, can guide things very nicely in X, Y, but not in, in Z. Do you ever catch a proteasome being uh, transported through the nuclear pore? Maybe I missed that. <laughs> uh, uh, well, as you have seen, I mean, we see many at the nuclear pore complex, but <clears throat> we have not been able to catch one in transit through the nuclear pore complex. <clears throat> I think we are working on a project with together with Cordula Enenkel from, from Toronto. Um, that is about protosome granules. And I mean, that can be <clears throat> so, which is a kind of a storage form of, and I think in that system, I think we should have under certain conditions, if we dissolve basically the granules, I mean, then we should have a lot of, uh, there are data that we have a lot of nuclear import. That should be a system that should allow us um, <coughs> uh, with some luck to catch proteasomes transiting the nuclear pore complex. I mean, this must be possible. This is clear, but I mean, is it 20S <clears throat> and regulatory particle alone, or is it the 26S? I mean, it's, um, it's a kind of the dream experiment I wanted always to, to do, and we have not managed to do it yet, but I mean, there's still hope. <laughs> okay, there's, I'll see, is there another one? Uh, Jan, if you'd like to uh, ask directly, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> yes, thanks uh, for the excellent presentation. Uh, here, uh, I realized uh, when you show the mouse lamina there, I found uh, there is uh, one fictitious mark there. Uh, it's, I'm wrong. It's, how do you do that uh, to keep the fictitious mark in your lamina? Yes, thanks. Um, I'm not sure I, un I understood it um, acoustically. George, could you repeat? So, um, I found there is a fiducial marker in the mouse lamella. Is that right? How do you do that? I think the fiducial markers we are using, I, I mean, fiducial markers in the lamella is, is still a problem, okay? So I think the <clears throat> you can use basically ribosomes, which are relatively high contrast, are abundant as kind of fiducial markers <clears throat> in, in lamella. That is what is done also to correct for for, for motion, etc. So um, currently, I, I think um, 
combining fiducial markers with um, which would help with the alignment of course <clears throat> uh, is it is a problem, but I think it works quite well to use ribosomes as fiducial markers. The sufficiently strong contrast. All right, thank you. Okay, terrific. Any other last questions? All right then, Wolfgang, thank you so much for, for doing this. It was absolutely terrific. Thank you very much, George. Thank you.